And so when we see a, bl- a high blood pressure in the office, it's, it's vital that we refer, refer out. Or we see abnormal breathing patterns, or we see a lump in the neck, or, you know, any other sort of visible things in the mouth that would lead us to believe that there is something else going on. For example, diabetes, we also know is a chronic disease. But if we have, let's say, a parent that goes to the physician and the physician says, you know, Mr. So-and-so, you have diabetes. The physician is not going to say, why don't you come back in six months? We're going to watch that. But as far as the patient is concerned, we are their number one advocate. Our, our only interest, our best interest, our only interest is the best interest of the patient. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to a bonus episode of A Tale of Two Hygienist podcast. My name is Andrew. And my name is Michelle. So for those new to the podcast, each week, Michelle and I bring on an amazing guest from the dental world who fills our nerd brains with new insight or affirms our clinical abilities. And we are so grateful for the time and effort these guests put into making us better. We also wanted to acknowledge that this episode is powered by Crest Oral-B. And this episode wouldn't be possible without them. And we know you guys are going to really enjoy this episode. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Well, welcome, Josephine, to the podcast. We appreciate you making time for us this morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I'm super excited. <laughs> Me too. This is a long time of coming. I mean, we, we talked, I mean, how many under one roofs ago? Well, we always three. run into each other at the airport, so. <laughs> Do you? Yeah, that's all the time. Oh, wow. That's so, special. Yeah. So I think, well, let's just jump right on into it. So you're, we're here at Greater New York. You're giving a presentation. And what is that topic? So the topic is closing the gap between what we know and what we do. It focuses on connecting dental research into clinical practice, really using that disease model of prevention and that focus model of prevention model, that model of care. Which is perfect. Yeah. That's right. Michelle's alley. I was going to say, like, speak into my nerd heart. <laughs> <laughs> so what, like, uh, for those that read that title, what do you want them to take away from that? In my background, I'm a dental researcher. I have a PhD in public health. And what I began to notice was that we as researchers can try very hard to develop programs, to develop educational programs centered around, say, pregnant women or children or the elderly. But if we're not able to actually get our research into the hands of clinicians, our research is pretty much mute. It's, it's a waste of time. So my goal in this lecture is to really help the average clinician understand the most current research and how to access it themselves. Okay. That's good. I feel like that's taking like the next step um, of, of, yeah, bridging the gap, so to speak. We're we're closing that gap um, between what we do as researchers and what we're getting into the hands of, of clinicians. So when you look at the research, it's pretty interesting because when we look at research in the medical field, the research tells us that Sometimes when a medical study is done, it takes up to 13 years for the medical profession to implement it into clinical practice. Mm. Really? Now, the dental profession, we're actually doing a little bit better. It's about seven to eight years. What the I was going to say, what? Say that's the <laughs> but, but still, that's, that's quite a long period of time. Mm-hmm. We know how much things change over that period of time. If you think about what you were doing, what you were wearing, you know, how old your kids were seven or eight years ago. That's a long, it's a long time, a long time. Yeah. So if that's the case, like you're just constantly behind the game then, right? Because if seven to eight years ago, like you said, you were wearing different clothes, your kids were not even speaking. (laughs) And now you, you go to 10 years. That's such antiquated information. Now, can you really apply it? Right. And, and so What we want to focus on is keeping up with the times. Mm -hmm. So that's really the point of the lecture. And this is the transitional science. I mean, it in itself is a whole field of study. Like you can study transitional science and people have their PhDs in this subject. So that's a whole different topic on how to get clinical research 
into or research into the hands of clinicians. So my goal is to sort of simplify it and make it easier because there are a lot of tools available to dental professionals to get those the most current information. So that's really my goal is just to help bridge that gap, close, close that gap. And some of the barriers are, are really just access to information. And it becomes a little overwhelming sometimes for practitioners to get information, especially if somebody says, oh, here's a research article, here's read the methods and the conclusion. And, and you know, what is a longitudinal study? Like, not all of us know that if we didn't go to school to you're study that. Too. Yeah. And if you're not living it, and just because we did study it, you know, I'm not going to remember something I learned 10 years ago if I don't constantly refresh my mind with it. Yeah. So, so there's, there's limitations and, and, there are ways for us to be more up to date with current literature and research. But what I always like to focus on also is that, you know, we have two different sides of our brain and the way our mind works. And sometimes our mind convinces us that we're using the analytical side of our mind, but we're actually making our clinical decisions based on our automatic side of our, our mind. And the research will tell us that, in fact, our mind develops its own sort of game or it, it tricks us into thinking we're using the analytical side of our mind when when we're really not. So for example, a patient comes in and we automatically offer a certain type of treatment based on what we believe is correct. But actually, if we take a step back and analyze the situation, um, implement current evidence into our decision-making process, we may come up with a different answer or rationale as to the treatment that we're providing. So is this kind of like unconscious bias? Absolutely. It's unconscious bias. Right. And so some of the things that I particularly like to focus on are present biases and also confirmation biases. So confirmation biases being what um, our brain likes us to believe and, and center ourselves, whether it's pe the people we hang with or what we read with what we already believe. So for example, we know that the current literature tells us that it is perfectly okay and very important for pregnant women to receive treatment, dental treatment. We know that, but sometimes, so somebody will come in and will, they'll say, oh, you know, I'm pregnant, I want to get a, a cleaning. And sometimes a front desk or somebody who does not have the education that a dental professional has says, oh, well, we actually can't see you till, till your second trimester. Well, is that really the current evidence-based reasoning? And if so, you know, just, just an example, but really take a step back and we have to ask ourselves, how did I come up with that conclusion? Is that just an automatic conclusion that I'm used to coming up with in my mind or is it actually really evidence-based? So really taking a step back. And, you know, for some dental professionals, it can be a little painful to change from what we've been used to all along. When I was in school, I was taught to scale every single part of the tooth. We don't do that apparently anymore. <laughs> You know, when I was in school, I was also taught once you lose bone, that's it. It's gone. Now they're, you know, growing bone, regenerative tissue and all these other sorts of amazing things. It's yeah, it's great. So it's really important for us to You're, keep up to date. It's so true. And I think that's our platform is like, don't let what you learned in school be what you do in 10, 20, 30 years. From yeah. Now. So my friends, if you listen and remember to only one thing that I say today, let it be this. The last thing you ever want to say is, well, what I learned in school was. Because unless you just graduated last semester, <laughs> what you probably learned in school has been updated. So we really need to work at keeping current with with our practice and and keeping up with with the literature but through that knowledge there's really empowerment to that because what we can actually do to help our patients is incredible and then we're going to have that certain strength behind what we know and be able to really more effectively educate our patients so is this like confirmation bias for you since we're surrounding ourselves with it's, uh, yeah. it's the same, same thing? That you exactly. Like that. <laughs> it's confirmation bias. hundred percent. This little thing. Yet, but she but. is using the analytical side of her <laughs> mind <laughs> to assess Are you really whether. Sure it's not her emotional side, just yeah, really loving. Sure there's a very small barrier, barrier between my emotional and analytical side. side. There's no emotional one. If a, a pregnant person comes and sits in your chair and you yourself as a clinician had a tough pregnancy. 
Mm -hmm. how that actually it's pushed upon and projected on your patients, even despite the literature. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So again, that's that confirmation biases. There's tons of different biases that surround us. And as clinicians, our job is that of as a healthcare professional. So we need to remove ourselves from situations and really look at what's best for the patient and what the literature recommends. And there are simple ways for us to, to get that information should we have questions about what is the best treatment plan for, for a patient. So what are those ways? So some of the ways that I usually like to discuss in my, my presentation are using the association websites that are already out there. For example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a very nice website. So we look at on their page, there are guidelines, which guidelines are not laws, they're not rules, but they are guidelines based on um, the most current research. Mm -hmm. And they have gathered the research themselves and they have um, put together guidelines for what is best for patients under these conditions. So for example, the most recent updates for perinatal populations, perinatal meaning right before and right after pregnancy, is that that is the most ideal time for a patient to get treatment or a pregnant woman to get treatment. So let's think about that. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has said the most ideal time for a pregnant woman to get dental care is around that perinatal time. So right before they deliver and right after they deliver. It also, then now that was the update. So previous to that, it also said that pregnancy, that dental care is both safe and important during pregnancy. And then it gives all of the supporting documentations at that point. So that's a really nice website to look at. But let's say we're thinking about, you know, is fluoride, should fluoride be used for children under the age of two? We could also go to the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry and look up that topic as well. And it's very simply states all of the guidelines and provides all of the research should you have to defend your decision. But otherwise, a clinician can say to a patient, you know, dear patient with minor child, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry recommends that you actually start using a smear of toothpaste at the first eruption of a tooth. That is an excellent way to educate a patient. It gives credibility to the statement. It helps the patient also understand the level of professionalism and education for the provider, for that clinician, the dental hygienist. So it's really important for us to be able to pull those. And believe it or not, if you use it once or twice, you're going to get into the habit of just repeating those, you know, those certain um, research statements that, that you're, that you know, and that you're comfortable with. So we know that most patients trust their dental hygienist and also the dental assistant, sometimes more than they trust the actual mm-hmm. provider, the dentist, you know, as sweet and kind as they may be, it's just human nature. So it's very important for dental hygienists, you know, to have that information. So do you have any thoughts or is this a part of your presentation when Let's say as a clinician, I hear what you're saying that I can start seeing a pregnant person in the first trimester or third trimester. I take that information, but to not make it like a blanket statement. So like, let's say high risk pregnancies or, you know, how do I have a conversation with that information if there's pushback from the patient or, or how do I take that and have bridge that gap to medical and talk to the OBGYN or. I mean, is there any recommendations for that? It's the struggle with hygiene times. Like it, the moment someone pushes back, they're like, oh, then they know more than me. Yes, yes. And, you know, when you think about a high risk pregnancy, you're thinking about a pregnancy that is already at risk for complications. You want to remove the risks of complications. So removing inflammation, removing infection, you know, treating dental decay, treating periodontal disease, those help to reduce the risk of a, of a patient. It is, there are certain populations that are going to require more um, or, or a clearance. But really what the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry says is that it is safe and effective for all pregnant women. And, and it actually lists what is safe. So it goes through anesthetic, it goes through fillings, it goes through, you know, just 
you know, non-surgical care. Yeah. And surgical care, certain surgical care as well. So one of the things we absolutely know is that not treating a patient with, for example, an abscess or an infected tooth is going to be more dangerous to the fetus than anything that we could do in most cases. But as far as bridging the gap between the medical profession and the dental profession, a lot of medical doctors definitely do refer their patients over to the dentist so that we're seeing a lot more of that. It's also important to note that let's sort of move away from from pregnancy and talk about the general population. Though it's also important to note that over 27 million people will see the dentist and never see a medical professional. So at that point, our role as a dental hygienist and a clinician really changes because we may be the only person that actually does any sort of health assessment on a patient. So when we fail to, for example, take blood pressure, I'm from Texas and Texas, we're required to take blood pressure on every patient every visit, but I know there's a spectrum across the nation. But for example, in Texas, that is one of the reasons that we take a blood pressure because we are oftentimes a front line of defense. And of course, there is situational rises in blood pressure due to dental visits, but that is actually a very small percentage. Oh. And so when we see a, bl- a high blood pressure in the office, it's it's vital that we refer refer out or we see abnormal breathing patterns or we see a lump in the neck or, you know, any other sort of visible things in the mouth that would lead us to believe that there is something else going on. So let's to circle back just as an example with looking at the association's websites and their guidelines, mm-hmm. would it be a smart idea to like cross reference, like maybe look at the OBGYN's website for our guidelines mm-hmm. and the pediatric dentistry and like see so, if they match or so they actually do match because you the a lot of the references that are on the pediatric side specifically for pregnancy actually come from the obstetrician associations mm. so that's why i'm saying that there's there's a simpler way to do it you could yeah you and i probably would love to <laughs> you know spend <laughs> spend our leisurely afternoon reading a, a re- <laughs> lots of research <laughs> yes you know that, that would be great this is yeah um a systematic review <laughs> yeah but no um most people don't <laughs> it's not their fun time but But for most people, we need to sort of provide the information in a way that's accessible and usable for them. Again, maybe one of the reasons why there is that gap is because we don't know that there are simpler ways to get the information. Mm -hmm. The ADA also has a great resource. They have guidelines posted right on their website. Um, They're a very easy one to get to. And they have a plethora of information um, and it's very easy to use. It's index based or you can just Google the term and it'll pop up. So all of those guidelines are there for us to to access. And the point being is when we're making those decisions clinically, really take a step back and say, okay, hmm, should I be insisting that this patient who we have seen in 12 months take x-rays? when just because the insurance pays for it, when actually ADA says that with a patient with no high risk of caries, their um, time period between x-rays can be anywhere from 12 to 36 months. Mm -hmm. So remembering to treat every patient differently is is, um, the point and really to step back and say, okay, what is best for this patient? And am I using the most clinical um, the most recent evidence-based practice. So what happens then when you have a body like the ADA, mm-hmm. bigger non-specialty kind of for everyone, all the, the dentist mm-hmm. saying things that are maybe contra to maybe what the, the medical specialist oncology or whatever subgroup, what, what would happen if there was a just I, I suspect if there was that issue, the ADA has um, a lot of very smart people on board and they would consult each other. But right now, the I mean, the ADA supports current clinical evidence-based practice. So they do a very good job at researching outside of just the scope of dentistry, but actually, you know, pull in other resources as, as well. The ADA of course, works well with the American Association of Pediatric Dentistry and and all of the other specialties as as well. The 
American Association of Periodontics. So the perio, perio.org. Mm-hmm. That is also another nice website to go to. That one I always find is a little more challenging to access the information because they like you to be members. Um, mm-hmm. So if you have a friend that's a periodontist, maybe mm-hmm. they can <laughs> share some of the information with you. But otherwise, most of the information is available. You have to go through the educators tab, though. Mm-hmm. And it's there. And of course, um, we are educators. So that's, that's why it's there. But they, they actually have it um, under like a dental hygiene educator tab. But it's, it's a- Were you kind of going there for like pre-med or ortho or? Not even necessarily. I just was thinking about some past experiences that, you know, I was working in offices where the doctors said that they were members of the ADA. And then they would say, oh, but the ADA says this. And then I'm like, yeah, but I don't think that that is necessarily current. And I couldn't find it on their website anywhere. So, but it goes back to the whole problem that we're having right now. And the whole reason why you're here is to have this conversation. Yeah. 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 So, you know, recently the ADA has really, per- and I, I wouldn't even say recent, depends on what you consider recently, but for the last few years, the ADA has had a very nice index of references that you can go to. So perhaps that's the reason they did it is because, you know, providers like us were having difficulty finding that information. Mm -hmm. So now they've sort of have simplified it. It's easier for us to access and, and it's there now. Yes. I, I completely understand being told that, well, this is what the ADA says. So we as dental professionals and educators, it is part of our responsibility to kindly and ethically help provide current knowledge to everyone. So, for example, we talked about the um, receptionist that answers the phone um, a little while ago. And we said, oh, well, we can't see you because you're pregnant, not until the second trimester. That dental receptionist does not have the training that we have. It would be our responsibility as the educators in the office to help her and others understand what the current evidence-based research is. And we could kindly go to them and say, well, you know, you know, receptionist friend, we actually should be seen. (laughs) We actually should be seeing pregnant women. Um, The ADA says, or the American Academy of Pediatric Industry says that we should actually see them before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after pregnancy. So um, let's make sure from now on, if we do have a pregnant woman that calls that we get them scheduled as soon as possible. I'm just thinking of all the things that they're experiencing in their pregnancy, you know, nausea, vomiting. How can we help, you know, dietary changes age, in general. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And their baby talking about tongue tie. And when do you start cleaning, Mm -hmm. you know, their mouth and all of that? Like, what a great opportunity. And to deny that. Right. So unfortunate. So the behavioral research, we also know that the best time to begin to educate somebody about dental decay is before they actually get teeth, before they actually are able to get decay. Because once you start that process, you know, the... uh, it's, it's only going to continue. Mm-hmm. It is a chronic disease. It is not a disease that is treatable by, you know, a simple shot, like a, like a vaccine right. or something. Yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. And, and if we really need to begin to treat that old disease like a chronic disease. So the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics tells us exactly what a chronic disease is. So it tells us that it's something that is not preventable by a vaccine. Like we were saying, it's not treated with medications or if it is treated with a medication, it does not just disappear. It's progressive. It could possibly lead to death and it's usually affected by health behaviors. So for example, lack of exercise, Mm -hmm. diet, different things like this. So when we think about cavities or dental disease, that pretty much um, describes it to a T. It's all of those things. For example... Diabetes, we also know as a chronic disease, but if we have, let's say, a parent that goes to the physician and the physician says, you know, Mr. So-and-so, you have diabetes, the physician is not going to say, why don't you come back in six months? We're going to 
watch that. Right? right. <laughs> right? Oh, no. It's so <laughs> true. <laughs> right? The, 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 the little diabetes. It's just a it's little just diabetes. It's a little diabetes. It's fine. It's, yeah. So the physician says we're going to manage this with a whole range of things. We're going to monitor your diet. We're going to monitor your exercise. You're going to take this medication. You're going to go see your eye doctor. You're going to go see your foot doctor. And so it's managed with a multidisciplinary approach. The same thing with dental disease. That's how we should be managing it. And we think about, you know, the progression of the disease. If you have somebody that has diabetes and it's unmanaged and they get a sore in their foot, can you imagine the physician saying, we're going to keep an eye on that for six months? No, because what is going to happen? It is going to be amputated eventually. It's it's going to become necrotic and it's going to be amputated. But let's think about how we approach a tooth. A tooth will have decay and then we'll say, well, we're going to watch that. What are we going to watch it do? We're going to watch it turn it get bigger. Yeah. And then eventually what's going to happen to that tooth? We're going to pull it. So why is it okay in dentistry for us to remove Amputate, Amputate body parts. Body parts. Yes. And not think twice about it. But in other um, areas of medicine, we would never think about, about doing that. Mm-hmm. So it's important to think of dental and oral diseases as a progressive disease. And the same way we would treat diabetes or pre-diabetes is we would really focus on prevention. The same thing with dental decay and, and periodontal disease. Before we go too much more into this, can we maybe make a qualifier on that particular state? Not uh, on the let's watch this thing. So I have, I, I'm hearing it in my ears and I'm just knowing that there's going to be listeners out there that are saying, all right, every little incipiency that we see, we need to drill, 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 baby, drill. Mm-hmm. And that's not really also what we're talking about because there is the opportunity for remineralization. So we're not saying wait for six months, but what is maybe an appropriate time period that we can monitor to see if it really is progressing disease or if it's been there for 30 years and we just now saw this patient as a new patient. Right, exactly. Okay. And so the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry has guidelines, but so does ADA for incipient lesions. And there's a lot of things that we can do other than in some cases drill or watch. There's um, SDF, there's fluoride varnish applications. And let's think about fluoride varnish. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry says that fluoride varnish for children is is ideal for high-risk populations two to four times a year. So does that mean that maybe that child that has incipient decay, that maybe we schedule them every three months for fluoride varnish to stop the decay process instead of just watching it? You don't use two packs every six months of fluoride <laughs> varnish. Just double the dosage. Just double it up. <laughs> so there is a dosage that is allowed for <laughs> different lecture. Um, so, you know, it, it it's really stepping away from the mindset that every patient should come in every six months right. and every patient should be allowed the same thing, but actually taking a step back and saying, okay, well, in this situation, this child is high at high risk. I'm really doing that assessment to determine if a child is at high risk or an adult, adults are living longer. They are mm-hmm. taking different medications than they did even 10, 15 years ago. So things have changed. Recession is certainly an issue, but certain medications will cause disease and or de- oral disease decay or, or periodontal disease because of dry mouth. So we really want to be on top of those things and not just say, okay, let's see what happens in six months, but say, you know, maybe you should be coming in every three months for a dental cleaning or every four months for a dental cleaning. What is best for the patient? So the watch goes away from, we'll just watch for it to break through we we'll watch and do nothing else. Yeah. Well, let's see if, like, if I uh, increase your fluoride toothpaste kind of thing, and in six months it's, in, you know, gotten better. Now it's this watch that we might say to our patient is now, um, let's be proactive in this yeah. moment and update your frequency and watch, in quotation marks, to see what our next step needs to be. Let's really focus on prevention. Yes. Instead of- Treatment. 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 Okay. Um, Just as the physician will focus on prevention for a diabetic patient, the same for the dental practitioner. 
focus. And in that case, they're, they're looking at the diet, which are very similar tra- changes in lifestyle, right? Right, exactly. And that's really where the change is going to come in. So I like to give a little scenario. And if you've been to any of my lectures, you've heard this because I tell it at every single one, but it really is my favorite. I like to, um, my son's name is Ryan. So he was a very active child. He was always running around, falling off of stuff, getting into (laughs) stuff. So let's say I had a tree in my backyard and Ryan likes to climb the tree. Ryan climbs the tree. Ryan falls off of the tree. Ryan breaks his arm. I take Ryan to the physician. We get the arm fixed. Arm is fixed. Cast is off. Ryan's running around the backyard again. He's climbing the tree. Ryan falls off the tree. This time he breaks his ankle. I take him to the physician. I fix his ankle. You know, he's in the cast. He's off a cast. Well, wouldn't you know it? (laughs) Ryan climbs up the tree again, falls off the tree. (laughs) That Ryan, I know. So am I fixing the problem every time I take him to the physician? No. No, the problem is the behavior. The problem is, is that Ryan keeps climbing up the tree. So I have to do something about that tree and something about that climbing. That is, that is what is going to prevent this. So in dentistry, if we keep allowing or, or we have a patient that comes in and says, okay, well, you have a cavity. We're going to fill it. Six months later, they come back. They have a cavity. We fill it. Six months later, they come back. They have a cavity. We fill it. Are we actually solving the problem? No, we're only treating the results of a disease. Dental decay is the result of a disease. It's not the disease itself. The disease process is what leads to the actual decay or the periodontal disease. So it's that behavior change that we have to change. And the, we know that the literature tells us that there's something like, what, 132 different things that affect disease in the mouth. So it's not just one thing. For us to say you need to floss more or you need to brush more, those, of course, are important. But there's more than just that to preventing decay. It's very multifactorial or preventing periodontal disease and really taking a look and taking a step back and saying, OK, what is actually best for my patient? It feels like that you might be talking about including, other, again, other specialties, just like the doctor who has a diabetic patient would say, okay, go see your foot doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Then, then are we advocating to go say, maybe you need you keep coming in with decay, go see a uh, nutritional counselor or nutritionist, or maybe you need to go see a gastroenterologist, maybe a acid you know, a sleep doctor. I, I, is that where we're going with this? Absolutely. If that is is that if that is what we identify in a patient, we most certainly should be referring out to other healthcare professionals. Again, 27 million folks will see the dentist and never see a physician. So if we're identifying any of those sorts of things, absolutely we need to be referring out and also encourage our medical professionals that we know to also refer to us as well, Mm -hmm. because that's going to be key. That'd be a good partnership. I think about it. Just have like a, just like you would like, you remember the old days when they said, had still wrote on the the piece of paper, like go see your Adonis. And then they clip your little bite wing into the Mm -hmm. little coin tab Mm -hmm. and send it. But having all of those special local specialists to be like, Hey, if we send people to you for dental disease, can you help them manage that specifically mm-hmm. and whatever else is going on too, but that specific, specifically? Well, and I, in my community, because when I was doing my thesis, it was on interdisciplinary and having hygienist in the ICU mm-hmm. for ventilated associated pneumonia and things like that. And then I was taking it a step further in my discussion, talking about future research and mm-hmm. where hygienists could be valuable in medical practices. And so I went to go talk to cardiologists and I, like, are you kidding me? Like, I couldn't get in, get in that office. Like, the gatekeeper was never letting me through. So it was so difficult. Right, right. So the public health realm, the dental public health realm, has been talking about this for years. Mm-hmm. And there are actually a lot of good programs, a lot of good initiatives that, that are taking place right now that are integrating the two. Best practices for integrating both medical into dental and how to communicate between the two, um, how to actually have a dental mm-hmm practitioner in a medical office. But of course, it it gets a little complicated with workforce rules and and different things like this. But as far as the patient is concerned, we are their number one advocate. Our our only interest, our best interest, our only interest is the best interest of the patient. 
that is that is our role. That is ethically our responsibility. Mm. You know, and another thing that I always like to mention is to always take a step back and never, as clinicians, we never want to let insurance dictate what is best for our patient. It is often difficult for us as um, clinicians because we never want to oversell anything. We never want to um, incur a cost for our our patient that is not ethically correct. But it is just as unethical to undertreat as it is to overtreat. Mm-hmm. So we need to remember that as well. And the way we verbalize things to our patients is important as well. Remember how we were talking about sometimes it might be more important to um, have a more frequent dental cleaning or a more frequent um, fluoride varnish application. Mm-hmm. So I get my teeth cleaned three times a year. Because I know that if I don't, I will end up with periodontal disease. And I went to school for a very long time to learn how to blush and floss. And I think I do it very well. But even I, as a dental hygienist, get my teeth cleaned more often than my insurance allows. So when we're talking to our patients, we need to help them understand that in there, there is really no such thing as dental insurance. Mm-hmm. That is a fallacy. That term is really not descriptive of what it is. It is a dental benefit. A Groupon. It's kind of like a <laughs> discount plan. So remember Ryan falling off the tree. If Ryan were to have broken his foot, the dental insurance would have said, okay, this year we're going to fix these two toes next year we'll fix those two toes oh and that pinky that's aesthetic we're not fixing that yeah. right it's yeah. totally different than medical mm-hmm. insurance so what we need to help patients understand is that it's merely a discount plan mm-hmm. doing things for patients like saying okay you really need one extra cleaning a year fortunately for you because you have a dental benefit, we offer a discount for that third cleaning. And we can divide that third cleaning into three payments. So let's say that cleaning is $60 Mm -hmm. out of pocket. Your actual cleaning is going to be $20 for three visits a year. I like that that more. That makes it more acceptable to the patient. If we say to the patient, your dental insurance only covers two cleanings, it's going to make it sound like that third cleaning is not needed or unimportant or Mm -hmm or maybe unnecessary Mm -hmm. when we know that it is. Making sure that we use the word diagnostic in our explanation as well. What you have been diagnosed with is a high risk for periodontal disease. What your child has been diagnosed with is a high risk for dental decay. Mm -hmm. Helping the patient understand that this is not because, you know, of all of these other issues that that may actually be taking place. They eat too much candy or you have Mm -hmm. soda in their bottle or but this is what they have been diagnosed with. And as a result, this is a treatment that is required, that is recommended. Mm -hmm. Your insurance benefits cover this, and this is um, what is not covered. I am not an insurance specialist, so (laughs) that is not my area. Um, But also as a dental professional, helping those that are, that are delivering that information Mm -hmm. for them themselves to understand what it Mm -hmm. is that you're doing. Because if they say to the patient, oh, it's only a dental cleaning, yeah, it's going to minimize the importance. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Or it's only a simple cleaning. Mm-hmm. That's the one that I add. Yeah. It's not simple. It's not simple. It's this a preventive. Is really, really great information. Like this is, I've, I, my little nerd heart is super happy. <laughs> so if people want to find out more information or read articles or attend a lecture or whatever, what, how can they find you? And if they won't have any questions, can they contact you? Sure. So um, you can find me online as the informed hygienist. I have um, a Facebook and a Twitter account. And also you can send me a message online. Is that the easiest Direct Facebook? Message. And probably yeah. Facebook is okay. probably the easiest. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so this much. This was such great info. We awesome. appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. We hope you enjoyed this episode powered by Crest and Oral-B. And be sure to check out the show notes and click the link to get your CE credits for this course. Also, you can check out dentalcare.com for more on-demand CE courses. And to listen to more great episodes from us, you can go to a tale of two hygienist.com. You are welcome to send us emails with feedbacks, questions, comments at a tale of two hygienist 
at gmail.com. And you can always find us on any of the social media like Facebook and Instagram. And we welcome all direct messages and sharing of all the episodes. Be sure to stay tuned for more bonus episodes powered each month by Crest Oral-B. Anything else, Andrew? I think that's it. Have a good week, everyone. Bye, y'all. Bye. Bye.